So George, uh, welcome to Screen Crusades, our movie show with Not Fest. How's it going? It's going great. How is it going with you? It's going, <laughs> it's going well. And I assume, having done a little homework on you, knowing that you're from Seattle and that you lived down here in LA for a while, uh, but you're back in Seattle. Is that where I'm talking to you now? Correct. Awesome. I, uh, I spent a lot of time there. Uh, one of my best friends is up there. And uh, so yeah, I, I, Seattle's the, the one place I end up going two or three times a year sometimes. So a big fan of it. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk to you. Obviously, we're here to talk about this film that you wrote, directed, and starred in, and are currently wearing the t-shirt when I trip to Browntown. But before we dive into that, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some work that you did prior to making this movie. One of the gigs that you had involved uh, music licensing and, and supervision for Disney TV. And uh, obviously us being a both a music and movie centric outlet, I'm uber curious about that and sort of what that entailed. And, uh, you know, when I think Disney TV, I think, you know, Wizards of Waverly Place and like those kind of shows. Um, I just super curious about that gig and, um, and where music fits into your life. Oh, it's sure. Uh, um, <laughs> it was one of my, uh, it was interesting when I first came to LA, I was doing a bunch of internships. And then when I finally needed to get paid, I went to an agency and they helped place me at uh, Disney TV, which was really cool to be on the Disney lot. Um, at the time, this was, <laughs> this was back in the 90s. So it, it was a while ago. Uh, the big shows were Home Improvement, Boy Meets World. Oh, and- so that's like Disney TV, but it's like ABC and you know, that whole Disney family. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yes, and this was before actually ABC was owned by Disney too. Oh, okay. So it's, yeah, it's a while back. Yeah, yeah. But, um, it was great. They uh, The way it typically worked was the writers would write a script. They'd send it along to us to make sure that uh, there weren't any music references mm-hmm. or they'd highlight where they wanted music. Um, and then I w- we would work with the companies that own the music to get the rights for the tv shows um it was it was kind of a changing industry at that time uh because you know initially you would just kind of get the rights for uh to be on the air and then syndication um and then we were just start they were just starting to do like videotape collections back then Mm -hmm. um and they were just starting to kind of comprehend the possibilities of oh maybe there may be future uh ways to watch this (laughs) (laughs) right right (laughs) oh maybe it doesn't just air once and disappear for all time until syndication yeah right and that's where um things get a lot of caught up i mean we would try a lot of times um towards the end before i left to like license you know an all known and future possible medias in in perpetuity Mm -hmm. um but a lot of times that would be difficult with popular songs. Yeah. Um, but that's why you'll see something like, you know, when Dawson's Creek was first airing on Netflix, for example, they couldn't use the song that was kind of their theme because yeah. it was too expensive. So, yeah. You know, what's funny in, in that regard, you know, one of my favorite shows of all time was Beavis and Butthead. And I remember the first time that it came out on I guess it would have been DVD. Maybe it was even VHS. I just remember the first time that I was able to own it. The initial versions that came out didn't have any of the music video segments. And I'm like, that's 50% of the show. I mean, I love the, you know, storylines and everything that was part of the show as well. But like, you know, Beavis and Butter commenting on video. And yeah, and of course it was like, oh, because that's a hundred different licenses you have to get every season for all those videos and all those clips and all that music and the rights holders, you know, I'm sure it got very complicated between like, well, this publishing company has half of the song and then here's the master recording. And then also you got to get likeness rights because it's a video. Uh, and eventually those did uh, make their way out. But I would imagine that that those early editions were victims of, of what you're talking about. of Just like the changing people not knowing how it's going to work. And then you, of course, also not to get too much on a tangent, but you also feel bad for bands who signed record deals that just sort of have these like little footnotes of like when whatever formats might happen forever 
in anywhere in the galaxy that uh, you know and the labels are like oh that covers mp3s oh that covers stream you know just covers it like everything um yeah and i i like to think that uh, uh we're out of the wilderness for the most part with that stuff but yeah it sounds like a really fun time to be involved and yeah it's funny because when you hear disney tv now you, th you think disney channel but i suppose this would have predated that like you forget that disney tv was a whole thing yeah before there was a disney channel before, before it was a brand in that sense yeah, I, yeah i'm trying to remember when disney the cable channel for disney start, first started showing up and i don't even know if they were doing original programming at that time or just showing repeats but yeah um it was it was a really exciting time like i said somebody who was just you know a couple years into the industry you know to yeah. be able to walk around the stages we get to go to the run-throughs oh um, awesome and it was it was an adventure i liked it yeah um and also i can see from the background from the long boxes and i think those are trade paperbacks further behind you i mean i, I see the infinity gauntlet i see deadpool's mask <laughs> i see the bat symbol uh i presume the comic books entered into your life at some point um tell me uh, sort of how you first discovered comics and, and what some of the staples were for you as a kid that, you know, that were, that have stuck with you forever. Cause I've found that those really formative things are still the things that I reference and, you know, still the stuff that I think about. Uh, sure. Well, um, I'm a bit older as Rory mentioned. So, you know, there wasn't all these video games and uh, all these other options back then. Of course. I was just a big reader and, uh, I loved comics. I was always interested in comics. And it wasn't until I was in, I think around the fourth grade, maybe the fifth grade, um, one of my aunts when we were sick brought us a new Teen Titans comic. And uh, if you've ever seen George Perez's art yeah. at the time, Marv Wolfman, oh man, I, I just knew I had to see what happened next. That was the first time I started hunting down in the grocery stores, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, mom, I'll go shopping with you just just so I could check if the new issue was out. And then, you know, I was there trying to find a spinner rack somewhere. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that was the only place back then. Yeah. Um, sure. And then comic shops started popping up. And then I was here through the whole image revolution. And uh, I actually was a comic book reporter for quite a while. Uh, oh, wow. Resources.com. Of course. CBR. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was great. I did that for easily over a decade. Um, it recent it switched hands a couple of years ago. They sold to a different owner, and that's kind of when I kind of offboarded. But um, it it was great getting to interview writers and artists and getting to go to all the cons. Uh, I've been to San Diego multiple times. So yeah, what well, what was your? Do you remember what the first year was you did San Diego? Um, well, I remember the first time being in san diego was like 96 oh wow so weird because i because usually usually i get to pat myself on the back in these conversations because my my first san diego con was 2002 but you're oh. you're way you're way ahead of me usually i say 2002 and people are like whoa <laughs> so you were there before it was the sundance film festival <laughs> oh yeah. yeah no before it was i mean you could walk the whole thing and you could yeah. still see in between uh i remember i went uh, Kevin Smith had just put out a clerk's comic book and I got in a line for that and it it wasn't even that long back then it was probably like 20 or 30 people long which was the biggest line at the time yeah um but my, jo yeah. my joke the last few years is I always tell people like hey if you ever need a break from the crowds and you just want to sit down and catch your breath just go where all the comic artists are <laughs> it's, you know just go find the comic books at comic-con and you, you can get away from the crowds uh, yeah, no, it's uh, definitely, uh, are you familiar, you must be familiar with Hall H then? Yeah, you know? of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That used to be my big assignment when I would go down there to report. Um, the first year, first time or two, and it was, it was somewhere in the mid, that first decade of the 2000s, um, you know, I go there and it was, it was pretty full, but then as I continued to go, like I went there the year the Twilight kids were there. And yeah. I had to yeah. get there at like five in the morning to get inside. And then once you get inside, you just lock yourself up. But I've seen so many cool things. I had exposure. I was there the first time they brought out the cast for uh, the new, the, what are they called? Star Wars 7. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I was there the first time John Favreau showed Iron Man footage and Zack Snyder showed 300 footage. And uh, oh, it's yeah. just, it's been weird to see it. Like you mentioned it, you know, from this thing that had films on the side to being all about. Yeah. Films. yeah and I mean, and it's still incredible, but I, I, always, I always point to uh, the year that I really was like, okay, this is officially turned into something else was it might have been 2005 or six i remember seeing there was a dane cook jessica alba rom-com being promoted at like you know they had like a panel and like stuff everywhere and that's when it was like okay this is just this is something else um no. yeah but, but but same i've had like so many great experiences there and i remember i was a reporter for mtv news at the time and i pitched going to, to san diego comic-con in, in 2002 and uh originally they were gonna let me bring um you know i mean this was you know we were shooting in beta it was for broadcast you know so it's like a beta a beta camera guy a sound person a dv cam camera person all these extra people and then as the show got closer and closer they were like yeah you, you can't have the beta crew you can you can just bring a dv shooter with you yeah uh, you can't have this you can't have that and then by the time it was like the thursday of san diego comic-con they were like yeah, yeah if you still want to go um it's you got to go by yourself uh you got to cover your own gas and find a place to stay so i went down there and stayed with a friend and walked the floor with a little dv cam and a little mtv news stick mic by myself and came and this was like right early in that transition because i came back monday morning and we had we would have a monday morning news meeting and i was like yeah i've got a tape on uh elijah wood and rob zombie and Hugh Jackman and Halle Berry. And I started naming all these interviews I'd done. And everyone's like, where were you? And I'm like, I was at the comic convention that none of you cared about. And it, it was definitely surreal. It's like, nobody gives you a cookie for it, right? But it was it was surreal going, you know, fast forward like 10 years later and MTV News would have, you know, they'd buy out like two floors of the hard rock and build like studios there. And, you know, I'm interviewing the cast of the Vampire Diaries. Like I was it came back as a freelancer. And, you know, it just was so, I mean, it just exploded in terms of, of pop culture, but, uh, you know, and, and I, I tried it, I, I feel like I, and it sounds like you're similar to me, you have kind of a foot in both worlds where you understand the gatekeeping and you have the vantage point of like, mm, this isn't quite, this whole experience is different, but also it's like, it's still awesome, <laughs> you know, like I still would be super excited and got, you know, got to do so many great interviews and and like you said, see, see stuff early and be part of those, those crowd moments where, you know, everybody's just like uh, the communal, it's like a concert, you know, like everyone's just like, it has this communal sense of like, ah, the thing, you know, so, uh, Tom Hiddleston coming out in character as Loki in Hall H, like that was just like, who, who doesn't love that, you know? <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah um so yeah teen titans george perez that's i, I love that um i was I, I came in through comics in such a weird way it's funny you, you brought up kevin smith uh because i actually had a conversation with him about this once uh rom space night was my entry to comic books um which yeah speaking of licensing and all of that that's like the wildest tale of toy licenses and, and comic continuity but that just happened to be it caught my eye at the local drugstore on the spinner rack and um the the first issue that i bought i think it was an annual and it actually had uh it was rom fighting an imposter rom on the cover so it was like two roms and I was like what is this so this is cool and and it was via rom space night where um you know the x-men guest starred for a two-issue arc and uh uh, heroes for hire were in there shang chi was in there you know the fantastic four it was like i i got exposed to the whole marvel universe via these like guest arcs and um and and that was around i think uncanny x-men was somewhere in the 160 170 range i mean it was chris claremont for sure and uh but but yeah i discovered the x-men through rom and then once i started collecting x-men it was then i was off to the races as a as a comic nerd yeah no it's funny you mentioned that because uh something that would never happen nowadays i don't know if you ever recall teen titans did cross over with the x-men that's long right time that yeah. was my introduction to the x-men i was like who are these guys you know yeah so many crossovers like that that yeah you wouldn't really get i mean we got you know 
later on it was like batman versus predator and the punisher meets archie and you know there's been a lot of wacky things but yeah like you were saying back then um there was a a book in the 90s like a like a, a not a graphic novel like a, a novel novel that was the x-men crossing over with star trek the next generation <laughs> just like who how like what <laughs> but, that, but it was like official it was like you know marvel and paramount like teaming up um uh, I just, sorry, I just wanted to add one thing. I don't yeah, know because I don't know if you heard. It might excite you. Uh, James Gunn actually tried to get Rom to be in Guardians of the Galaxy. No, I never of, heard that. Oh yeah, but because of licensing issues, he couldn't make it happen. Yeah, the licensing issues are so wacky because it's. And I tried to get into uh, was it IDW? Somebody has whoever's doing the Hasbro stuff is doing comics. I think it's. I think it was IDW. They, they did do. I'm pretty sure it was IDW. Yes, they just did like a, a new series on it, but it was... Yeah, they tried to do a Hasbro shared universe that's like G.I. Joe, Transformers, Micronauts, and ROM all sharing a universe. But the problem is like, you know, Marvel, everything we love about ROM, like, like Parker Brothers was like, here's the toy. And then there was a little blurb on the back of the box and the toy sucks. You know, when I was an adult, like one of the first things I ever bought on eBay when eBay was new is I was like, I never had the ROM toy. I find the ROM toy and then you get it. And you're like, oh, the toy sucks. No wonder. Um, but, you know, there's just a little blurb on the back that was like, you know, he's from Galador and he's fighting the dire race. So whoever owns the license now, Hasbro, gets the look, the name and that really basic setup. But everything else that was wrong, all that mythology was all Marvel, uh, you know, so and it's and there's like weird ways where ROMs appeared in the MC, like in the Marvel comic universe, but they can never say his name when he does and it's in his human form. Yeah, it's like so it's, it's such weird. a mess. But yeah, but but for people that like to nerd out about licensing, <laughs> it's yeah. the ultimate exploration. Uh, the, another one too I heard is uh, Micronauts. I don't know if you remember those guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. They, they were big in Marvel for a while too. Yeah, and that's From another Hasbro one now too. Yeah. yeah. And and I know that they're all, that's another property that uh, they're always trying to figure out how to like. I mean, I mean, we're at a point where, as you and I are taping this, we're a couple of weeks away from a Moon Knight TV series with like an A list movie star in the role. So, you know, there's a Werewolf by Night series on the way. Like. Uh, you know, so at this point, Micronauts, it's like, it seems like they're, you'd think they'd be further in, ahead in line than some of the stuff that we're actually getting now. Uh, so I, I bring all this stuff up because A, it's fun. And B, I feel like, you know, learning about storytelling and uh, archetypes and comedy and pathos and all these things that are going to show up when you make you know a microfinance movie written directed starring produced uh semi-autobiographical <laughs> one might say um yes semi <laughs> that's, that's a good way to do it semi <laughs> <laughs> um i would think that all this stuff comics and uh and obviously your experience you know working in film and television and other roles tell me about how all that dovetails into you know making your own passion project um sure uh, as you probably know, uh, anybody with a dream who's a big dreamer, they want they're you know chasing after a big goal. Uh, usually, almost always, there will come a point where they have to make a choice. You know, am I do I keep chasing this, um, or do I focus on? <laughs> I, I always call it the normal things. Most people, I don't know if there is a normal, but you know, family, kids, all that stuff. Um, and I came from Seattle, went down to LA, worked in the industry, went to USC graduate program, got my film degree and uh, did a little bit of stuff down there. But LA is a tough, <laughs> tough living, especially if you're a young couple and starting to think about all those other things. And mm -hmm. uh, so we had to make a choice and we came back up here. We started our family. Um, I still try keeping my toe in film and comic books, obviously. Uh, and uh, as things continued on, you know, I would be writing scripts, writing scripts, nothing was happening with them. And uh, this, this kind of gets, seems a little somber, but uh, 2016, my mom got cancer and passed away. 
And I put on quite a bit of weight from, uh, from going through that period, plus just raising kids and getting older. Sure. And I had this funny notion of uh, what can make a guy, you know, lose a lot of weight short of a million bucks. And I came up with this idea for a sexual bet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I double checked with some of my more normal married friends, I like to call them. And they were all like, Oh yeah, that's something I'd be interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that you took a uh, informal poll. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to know if I was a pervert or if it, yeah. or if this was something other people it would cross their minds. And I, you know, family uh, feud style of polling, they, they said yes. So I went forward and I created the story, but I also wanted to kind of include this whole my experience hitting, you know, middle age and uh what I've gone through as kind of the impetus for yeah for the bet and uh like I said, fortunately my wife and kids like the script <laughs> and uh we all worked together and over a summer we shot it here at our home uh most of it um it was a three-month shoot since i had to lose the weight i'd shoot my part real time so over 12 uh 12 weekends we shot over weekends uh i lost 50 pounds and made a movie wow and lost 50 pounds in three months i mean that in and of itself is pretty amazing <laughs> just all by itself <laughs> it's also sort of like how can i motivate myself i'll write a movie about a guy who <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it's like nice uh fringe benefit there uh, so the the character that you play in in the movie you know I, I hear some of your real story in there because he's also someone who's kind of struggling with like okay i've you know i've got the nine to five job but i also have this you know, I'm a writer and um, I'm, you know, blogging into the void. I, I think three or four people are reading it, but then it, you know, inadvertently uh, becomes a much bigger thing. Uh, so, yeah, so there's, I, I feel like a lot of the great comedies, you know, you come up with these fantastical situations, but they are grounded in a lot of real life experience. Um, was it hard to navigate that balance? And, you know, I like, I love the big disclaimer that comes up at the beginning where it's like, my wife wants everyone to know this is not true. <laughs> like, this is not a documentary. Um, how hard was it to navigate it, that balance? It's, it was trick. It was tricky. It was something I was very conscious of every time we went out and shot. Um, because, so I, part of the reason I, I wanted to do kind of a raunchy comedy is just because I enjoy raunchy humor. Mm -hmm. Um However, if a film is only raunchy humor, then it uh, there's not much to it. It's, it. It could be a YouTube video. So I yeah. wanted to have you know something real into it, which is why I imbued it with elements of my own history. Um, and, but like I said, even even the parts that get serious and get a little heavy, I tried to have one or two moments of levity in there because a lot of times, if you're in a fight, if you ever stop an argument with a spouse and just step back sometimes you can hear what you're saying sounds pretty ridiculous mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I tried to point out a little bit of that because i didn't never want to go too dark into it um but at the same time there were some still some heavy hitting moments and i had to let those breathe accordingly yeah um well said and i can only imagine do you think that you know, because because like you said, I think Judd Apatow and Seth Rogen and a lot of those raunchy comedies follow that same sort of model that you're talking about, where <clears throat> part of the reason why they're so rewatchable is because there is heart, you know, it's not just raunch for its own sake. Um, what do you find as you've shown the movie to people? What are people connecting with the most, like the feedback you're getting? Like, is, is it the heart? Is it the raunch? Is it the is it the uh, middle-aged family guy is it the the office job because you cover a lot of bases um you know you you kind of dabble in different storylines that can almost be their own movie which i also appreciated about it like the the squabbles of the moms at the drop off at school like that could be you know you could do a whole movie on that you could do a whole movie on the the office job and the boss and the pranks and stuff like that what, what do you find as you're getting feedback on it or people are connecting to the most um, I think it kind of goes on according to people's own background. Mm -hmm. Um, 
like I said, a lot of people who have these ambitions, uh, like myself, they're very caught up in that aspect of it, of, of the uh, dreaming part. And yeah. uh, a lot of the women are caught up. Well, it's, it's interesting. It, it's a little bit of a split. They love, um, they love the family part, but they also love seeing the, the gal pals. Mm -hmm. There's not too many movies where the gal pals hang around and just kind of talk openly about sex things. <laughs> yeah. And and for a movie written, directed by, and starring a dude, it, it uh, shockingly passes the, what is it, the Bechdel test or the, <laughs> you know, do you, does it have a scene where two women are talking about something other than a guy? Um, and it does. <laughs> like, it, you know, there's strong female roles in this movie for a raunchy comedy with a premise like it has. I appreciated that too. Um, yeah, no, it, it's been, th there are people who, <laughs> I have come across people who just wish there was more raunch. Um, but like I said, that that wasn't what I exactly set out to make. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing I think that I like about it is just, <laughs> many people are just surprised by it. Like I said, they're, they hear the premise and they all go in and, and to be honest, I don't like to think I'm doing a bait and switch, but it is like, you know, this premise of getting you in there. No, it's, good. it's 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 chocolatey and then it has like this nougat center you know it's a very it's a it's a it's a mixed bag in, in a good way i think that those i think that's you, you can sense that that's what you what you were aiming for yeah and the and the other thing too is like i said um i think a lot of people as you mentioned uh just just to have kind of a raunchy comedy for people with kids you know usually mm -hmm. they're targeted to college age people but yeah um and that's what I appreciated that uh, my lead actress and the distributor and everybody who's been working with me on it really got about it. Yeah, I, I want to ask you about, it's funny because you, again, you mentioned Kevin Smith earlier and I appreciate it. It was almost like an homage to Silent Bob, the, the character in your office who's kind of just sitting silently and nodding to things. And then he has this great, uh, imparts all this wisdom and reveals all this stuff about himself in a matter, in a matter of like a single uh, monologue. Uh, tell me a little bit about the inspiration for that character. And, and of course, I'm fascinated by the actor who played him because he looks like we probably listened to the same music. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is uh, Sam Schlegel and he plays Polly. And uh, you kind of got it spot on. It kind of is a tip of the hat to Silent Bob. Um, the so the job that my character works is actually somewhat close to the job I was actually working while making the film. Mm -hmm. I worked at a university in the IT department. Um, we all pretty much felt the way that the characters describe in there. <laughs> if you've ever worked for a state university, you might know how it is. <laughs> um, and um, each of our characters actually, there was kind of those archetypes kind of sitting around the office there was the guy who never talked who kind of once in a while he threw out something wise and then there was the uh intense young guy who just kind of hops all around and uh the interns and um so it was just kind of based on my own experience uh of who i interacted with in that job over the years i, I awesome. <laughs> yeah during during the filming uh I kind of got let go from the, there, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't, and you weren't, were you using the university as the location for those scenes or, or that's somewhere else? I, I made up the name of the university, so I wouldn't get in any, in any oh, trouble sure. with college. But uh, yeah, I mean, we use, it was, that's exactly where I work. So. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So yeah. So very semi-autobiographical in the sense that you're, 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 these are very lived in locations. They feel like real places. <laughs> that's because they are. <laughs> um, so how did you go about casting? Um, are these, are these all friends? Were they all people you had in mind for these roles? Did you have like an audition process where you met with actors that were just looking to be in an independent film or how did that all come together? Uh, we had several uh, casting sessions. It was just me posting everywhere in Seattle where an actor would go, hmm. um, posted at different acting schools, different acting boards. Um, and we got, we got a good assortment. Like I said, um, I described it as a raunchy comedy without nudity, you know, but I didn't go over the complete premise, although I did say the yeah. title. I wasn't sure how many people 
some people figured it out yeah come, come to my audition <laughs> yeah <laughs> that could that could scare some people away <laughs> yeah and uh i even auditioned people for the role i ended up playing i, I wasn't 100 percent sure i was going to do it but there was nobody who wanted to lose 50 pounds in three months first. right um and yeah i just was very lucky i, I found kendra um uh, mcdermott who is plays my wife uh, she just did an outstanding job. The thing I loved about her is that she's a mom of two young kids herself. Um, she kind of has a little bit of Laura's mentality too, you know, as, as adventurous she is, she, you know, there's a little bit of, whoa. <laughs> um, so it was, it was just a lucky find. We just have great talent up here in Seattle, cast and crew. Uh, I wasn't, this movie has grown a lot bigger than what I was expecting, to be honest. I kind of just wanted to do that make this because i wanted to make it mm -hmm. i didn't know we were gonna uh get a super professional cinematographer who just ended up loving the script and wanted to do it same with sound editor um and uh yeah everything just god bless came together yeah that's great and so what's the journey for the movie from here uh, you know where 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 and how are the best ways for people to see it that want to discover it and um yeah, where, and, and, and where does that take you? Are you working on something else? Are you already kind of wheels turning about the next thing? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, so yeah, we uh, finished the film. We did the festival circuit the past year. Um, actually, about two weeks ago, we just had a screening at the Chinese Theater in LA, which was- Oh, rad. Cool. Yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> that's Dude, that's the dream <laughs> to see your movie there. It was funny. The, the entire time I lived in Los Angeles, I kept meaning to go to a screening there. I never made it to a film in there. And then, so the first film I watched in there was my own was like, this is awesome. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, that makes up for never having gone there when you lived here. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so where can people see it now? Is it coming? Sure, uh, March 22nd, it starts streaming everywhere. Okay. So um, if you wanna find the locations, I recommend people stop by our website. Uh, it's triptobrowntown.com. Um, you'll also be able to find it uh, through our Facebook page, facebook.com slash trip to Browntown, or you can visit our distributor, Gravitas Ventures, and they have the listing. But the easiest place is probably our website. Pick up a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, merch. merch. Awesome. Um, well, dude, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I love uh, evangelizing for any, any passion project that's a labor of love, and especially, I didn't even know till we logged on that you had the comic backgrounds. I was immediately like, ah. Oh, my, my people you know <laughs> so um yeah and uh hope to get to speak to you about the next one whenever it's time to talk about the next thing i'd love to do that so. hopefully there will be <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you made you made it this far well, <laughs> sky's you. the limit um well awesome man we'll have a good rest of your day and um yeah hope to speak to you again soon all right sounds great good luck to you cool. thanks man